Sophia, I'm so happy that you're on. I've known about you for so many years, even before I started a podcast, I knew who you were and uh -huh. I live in LA. So I've always like kind of watched you do your thing and found it so aspirational and calling other women up just by being you. I feel like you just set a new standard. So I'm so happy you're here and I can't wait to get into all the things. So thanks for making the time, first of all. Yeah, thanks for having me. I love your show and it's like exciting to be on and I haven't really been in the pod or any outside of my orbit sphere for a while. So it's like, I'm a little rusty, but it's fun to, to have a conversation and, uh, and talk to your audience. Well, I can tell you right now from doing 700 interviews and having like all these amazing people on, I don't know how you personally could be rusty because there's something about you. And I just said it before we started, I feel there's such a realness to you that what I mean is I just feel there's like you're present, whatever you're doing, wherever you are in your life, you're honest and present. And to me, there's no performing. So then I, that's why I'm like, it's the best. It's just very mm -hmm. refreshing. So let's get into it. So we're going to start where it starts, right? Like a lot of people know of you. Some people may have been listening to you for years already and read the book 15 times and given it to a bunch of friends, but some people might just know about you and they don't actually know the story and they didn't really yeah. read the book, right? So Let's just give them a little context because it is so easy to look at people and say, she's such a badass and she must have just landed at the top of this tower and you actually began somewhere else and then really found your way to everything. Like you yeah. had to have the courage to face yourself in so many ways. Give us a little bit of context about your life. Yeah, uh, I'm an only child. I grew up with poodles. I now have three. Um, I was born in San Diego, lived there till I was seven, mostly grew up in beautiful Sacramento, California, which I was chomping at the bit to get out of in high school. I was very angsty and I did not know what entrepreneurship was. I thought business was for like people, like squares. I've never thought about starting a business, <laughs> but I always had like weird, like stands on the corner, lemonade stands. I had a book called odd jobs for kids that had literally like Xerox flyers you can print out before you could even have clip art and like That's make adorable. stuff on the internet, but it wasn't like, Oh, I want to make money. I don't know. I was just like, came out like that and moved out at 17 was really like anti-capitalism was like very much, you know, like this is gross. Consumerism is gross. And it is, um, except I sold a lot of clothes. I don't know, you know, stumbled into all of this and it was I'm vintage. A, I'm aware. Yeah. So keep going. With. And I'll get into that. And so worked a bunch of really crappy odd jobs, like, you know, record stores, uh, shoe stores. I wasn't a good employee. And when I was and this is <laughs> like, you know, I st started my first company at 22. So I was pretty young but I thought like the margin between the amount of money you were making and the littlest amount of effort was like success, like sitting in the lobby at an art school, checking student IDs was like my last job. Um, and then I was like, I started getting all these friend requests. I, you know, sitting in a lobby um, and just like have idle time and getting all these friend requests on MySpace from eBay sellers that were selling vintage clothing. And I like loved vintage. It was all I wore. It was like all I could afford. I'm in San Francisco at this point and clicked through and looked at their listings. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this thing selling for $250. Like it's cool. But like, I wasn't like a fashion girl where I would never have like, you know, outbid somebody on a thing. Like I love, you know, the hunt. And so I was like, okay, I know where to find this stuff. Like I thought hate street was expensive and this was so expensive. The dollar was really low. So like a girl in Australia and a girl in like Copenhagen would be like duking it out. And $250 was so much less in 2007. So I decided to start selling some vintage online. Not all of it worked. And I wasn't a CEO. I wasn't a startup founder. I wasn't a founder. I was an eBay seller. Like I was selling some stuff on eBay. I had to give it a name, right? You have to make an account. So I called it Nasty Gal Vintage. And took all the photos, wrote all the descriptions as any eBay seller does. Not that special, small bootstrap business, business. And it became a business because I was so curious and just started putting one foot in front of the other. And eBay had given me 
this incredible framework to be like, okay, I need this in and I put a price in and I weigh it and I ship it. Had I had to figure that all out by myself, I don't think I would have started selling online. And now, right, like 15 or how many years later after I started Nasty Gal, there's Shopify and Squarespace and Square and all of these amazing platforms right. for people to start businesses with. Etsy didn't exist. Um, and so did eBay for about a year and a half. The first year sold $75,000 worth of vintage. Um, second year, 250K. And around then is when I, halfway through that year, I left and launched my website. Left eBay, nastygalvintage.com. Year after that was 1.1 million. And at this point, I'm not just selling vintage. I'm going to trade shows and I'm curating brands based on what my audience gave me indications that they like love. So I knew I was able to kind of test my audience with one-off pieces and then understand her and what it was that she wanted to wear. So it was 1.1 and six and a half million. And by 2011, we were doing 12 million in revenue with no debt, no investors, um, you know, no loans, no friends and family, like startup money. I literally just like flipped clothes and then investors came in and they put 50 million, $60 million into the business. And that's kind of where the story that everyone else is, you know, that's when I kind of got thrust into the spotlight as this poster child of entrepreneurship. I mean, this is a long story. Should I continue? It's so good. Keep going. Okay. It's like exhausting to say out loud. And I'm like, what? All that happened? Like, I'm tired. I'm deeply tired after talking about this and I'm triggered. No. Um, so they injected $60 million into the business. We said, okay, these were all like people with more experience. I'd hired like chief operating officer and had like really experienced investors, some of the best in Silicon Valley. And we were like, great. So we're growing really fast. We're going to do 28 million this next year. Um, by the time they invested, that was the expectation. And then the year after that, we're just going to do a hundred million. And so we took that, you know, $60 million in venture capital and hired a hundred people in a year and moved into more warehouse space anticipate because I had grown outgrown every office and warehouse I had been in. They were like so fast up until that point. So we were like, okay, let's, we have to sign a longer lease now. Let's get a big space and a big warehouse in Kentucky and hire a guy from Zappos to run fulfillment and all this stuff. Um, and it, and we eventually hit hundred million in revenue, but it took a couple years and it cost us a lot of money to get there. Um, and that's a huge accomplishment, but I didn't understand what a comp like that a company could lose money and still operate. You know, at that point I had not really understood finance. I didn't know how to read a profit and loss statement or a balance sheet. I didn't really understand cash flow because there was always cash because the company needed cash because that's what companies need to operate. And by the time things got really complex, I like I didn't even have like a foundational knowledge because I was running on intuition and wit and like common sense and a and a and a financial kind of statement was so complex by the time we got that big, that understanding how to manage the business like that became really challenging. During that time, when we were doing around hundred million in revenue, I wrote a book called Girl Boss. Um, I did not anticipate it to um, become what it did. It spent 18 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. It sold half a million copies. It's so much. Netflix made a series out of it called Girl Boss, and there's someone playing a girl named Sophia, <laughs> starting a company called Nasty Gal. Charlize Theron produced it. That was a trip. And in 2016, I left Nasty Gal. It, it fell apart uh, for a lot of reasons. There's no single kind of like what happened. It doesn't happen overnight that a company falls apart. Um, we were overvalued. So they had said in 2012, when we were doing on our way to 28 million in revenue that we mm. were worth $350 million. Mm. So for anyone else to come in and invest after that, the expectation from our investors was that those people were going to pay more money and not yeah. 400 million, but 
a billion, right? They want to multiply their money. They don't want like incremental uh, markups. Yep. So that was one of the challenges, but I was a really young, naive founder who had never, literally never worked in an office before, had no model for what leadership looked like, was trying to learn on the fly as I was building this rocket ship. And I can learn really quickly, but the learning curve for this was like steeper than my ability to learn and adapt. Totally. And that happens in our lives. Yeah. Oh my gosh. We learn a lot. Even if we're not learning it fast enough, eventually we learn. Yeah. Well, let's take a pause because you just literally said so much. And as you were speaking, and then you literally said it out loud, like I'm exhausted. I was like, wow, like this Mm -hmm. is fascinating. And I don't know what else you're going to do in terms of ever writing books or anything, but to me, it's so juicy the sequel because, I know. <laughs> because so often, right. I talk to at this point, thousands and thousands of people every single day. And what's fascinating is how there is this feeling of more is always better, right? Grow the business more, yeah. keep growing the business. And we've had so many founders on this show who, ha- who have said something so similar to what you're saying to where there needs to be a new understanding of like, where's the actual sweet spot where you're making cash and having fun and being the person you actually feel authentically most suited to be versus make more money. Because when you started telling that story, there was no pressure. It was just an experiment. You were just having fun. You were unattached. You were taking your own photos. And that first 75,000, I think you said you made, is just the best, right? It's like, oh my gosh, like I played with something, then it turned to 250, right? And even when it got to this point where you're like, oh my God, like it's making a million dollars, right? It's It's like- like, I can buy a Nissan. It's like, it's amazing. And then all of a sudden at some point, right? The world has ideas about you. You know, you are all these things because you're very much like firecracker. You're smart, you're a risk taker, and you're also really beautiful. So the world comes along and says- I, you could be the horse we bet on and we're going to give you this amazing thing called we believe in this possibility. And now you kind of put yourself into like the temple of doom because it's like, I don't actually, wait, do I want this? I was actually vibing. I was actually feeling good. So what would you say looking back are some of the things you would say to an entrepreneur? Cause we're going to get to it in a second. You, you do teach people to become great founders. You believe in it. However, There's a, there's a place at which the train derails and no, no one's even happy. So what are some of those lessons that you think you've learned to where you now would say, this is a litmus test for how, you know, when to just sustain what you're doing and enjoy it versus push to earn more. Mm -hmm. I think it starts with your goals, right? And I didn't have goals. I didn't, you know, I came up out like just accidentally. And as American dream E rags to right. riches the story was, which inspired a lot of people, community college dropout, no, you know, just like no connections builds this thing. Wow. Totally. What great, let's talk about it. It's very cute, but it's also not the best. It's inspiring in that anybody can start a business really truly, but having experience either in a career, in a workplace, in the domain, working for someone in the domain that you're starting a business in, really anything that, anything, any preparation before you start a business uh, that anybody does, they're already leagues ahead of where I was when I started. And when you don't have intention, scaling, no intention, scaling serendipity only goes so far. Like it's, it's fun in the beginning, but when you have an organization of hundreds of people and you have tens of millions of dollars and responsibility to your vendors and customers, and there are so many stakeholders, it requires a plan and you have to start with one for that to scale into something beautiful. You have to start with intention, whether it's how you run the company culture what the budget's going to look like, how fast you're going to grow each year. You know, 
companies actually control their growth. I didn't do that in the beginning and it was an amazing rocket ship, but had it grown more slowly, I would have had time to learn some of the fundamentals that would have really helped me once it was a massive business. Um, so, and, and then it also is like a question of like, what kind of lifestyle do you want to have? I didn't exactly. understand lifestyle. Like when I was 22, 25, I was just like, oh my God, I'm just doing this. I can subsist on Boston market and Starbucks. <laughs> this is great. I'm just going to stay up at all hours, ship my packages at 11, be at an estate sale at 7am lined up with all these like 60 year old antique dealers running straight for the closet. And I'm 38 now. And my, I'm like, oh, lifestyle, you know, like I don't want to grind in the same way I do, but I also want to be able to go to yoga in the morning and be like kind of a well-rounded person that I never was really taught to be and wasn't for so long. And mm. yeah, so some people are willing to put in that grind and you can build a business profitably and sustain an amazing lifestyle for yourself, owning 100% of your business, not taking investor money. It can be an amazing lifestyle, right? For you and your family. And you put that money in the bank. You can also build something with enterprise value. You can do them both at the same time, but some people optimize for enterprise value over revenue. And enterprise value is how much somebody values your company at, which is usually more than the revenue that you're making. So they value nasty out like 10 or 12 times their revenue, which was so much money, but you can build something to ultimately sell and not pocket the money every month or year in the same yeah. way that I know you do. And I'm now doing, cause I like bootstrapping businesses and I'm good at it, but there is an opportunity for people if they're willing to, you know, put in the grind, not pay themselves very much right now um, and possibly take investor money to build something that you know, they plan on being worth so much that eventually they're going to sell their stock in that and then they'll make money. Yeah. It's really an interesting thing because you made this so famous, this whole world of girl boss, right. And it, it had such powerful ripple effects, right. I was just doing the research today for, for a project, not even related to this, but it is, everything's always related. And it was saying something like there are eight, 8.8% of fortune 500 CEOs are, are women, right? Yeah. That's like ridiculous. I mean, we make up half the population. And so what I'm saying and what I'm hearing you say, and what I want to ask you more about is, you know, we are girls who want to be bosses. However, the way we were raised, okay. Is that when women went into the workforce in the seventies and eighties, finally, they thought they had to be like guys, right? Like in order to be successful, it's like, forget thinking about things like your quality of life and yoga and lifestyle. It's like, do it like this and do it even better. Now you have something to prove. So you better do the same, but better. Right. And I have three kids and I have built a business with a team of four people. We make a few million dollars a year and I intentionally built this business so that it would be my life that came first. Yeah. And I feel like the new and improved version of girls really being bosses is to say, I'm not doing it on their terms, right? Mm -hmm. Like a woman's cycle is 30 days, more or less, right? One egg every 30 men, it's 24 hours. They renewed every 24 hours. It's like, they're, we're just different. Like we're literally different. We're all about like more of this sort of like qualitative resonant, like potent, right? And they're like, boom, 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 literally like hustle, 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 right? Mm -hmm. It's just in the way you just told that story, what's reflected is that as you grew up, so did your intentions. So did your ability to say, well, wait a minute, I still want to be a business person, but I want to have a life. And at some point this stopped feeling fun. It felt exhausting. So mm -hmm. now when you're teaching women to build businesses, what possibility do you see? Like, where do you see there's a possibility for them to have a beautiful thriving business and a quality of life? Mm -hmm. I think for women, what I see the most is not necessarily identifying like a gap in the market. Obviously, when you start a business, you want to create something unique. You want to see the landscape. Wow. Okay. Maybe there are other brow artists out there because a brow artist is an entrepreneur now. 
but how can I do this differently in my, you know, local region or how can I market myself differently? And they're not necessarily looking at like, wow, you know, the mattress space is so outdated. I'm not passionate about mattresses, but I'm going to raise a bunch of money and start a mattress business. Right. I think women naturally are, uh, drawn to start businesses that feel in line with right. who they their are passion. and yeah. their interests. And that's what motivates us more so than, oh, look, there's a business opportunity. Correct. And I think that can also be dangerous because women don't, aren't taught how to evaluate business opportunities in the same way that men are. So there really is kind of like a, a marriage of what is natural for us to shoot from the hip and pursue our passions and the things we're naturally talented at, but also understand how to put together a plan, understand finance, understand leadership, understand what the opportunity is for you and how to adapt your business over time instead of just be like, my passion, I'm just putting my passion out there because that doesn't always work. Your passion and people's desire to pay you for that don't always match up. Definitely. So too precious about it. Um, yep. Yeah. I want to go back to what you said. Um, and it was just like a comment you made, but it's so powerful. You said my customers, it actually said she, my customers, she was already indicating to me what she wanted. Right. And when people are beginning, and I would say most of the people listening to the show are at a place where they're working their side hustle, hoping to be able to leave their job, or they're hoping to even start the side hustle. Right. So sort of near the beginning, and when I look at your beginning, it was extremely successful, right? Very successful. And in looking back at zero to a million dollars in revenue, I want to see if we could unpack and understand some of the things that you now know are the reason that it worked, right? And one mm -hmm. of the things sounds like it was like listening to your people, right? Like not just blindly choosing things, but listening. Tell us more about that and what else you think were some of those reasons that you got from zero to the first million? Yeah, I think one is that I'm an introvert and I love being behind a computer. Like, I don't like, I'm not like a gamer and I don't sit online all day, but my comfort level is building something from behind the scenes, which is ironic because I got cast in the spotlight. Now I'm like, oh, I have social media following. I'll use it to like, you know, share my knowledge and wisdom with people. But like my comfort zone is like, okay, I'm going to like, you know, I'm learning Webflow right now. I'm like building websites in Webflow. It's really hard. I'm just like, I tweak out. I love it. I love learning. And it means I'm in the weeds. And sometimes it means I could be a better leader and delegate better, but it's what I love. I'm, I'm wildly curious, you know? So I'm like, what? I, I reverse engineered <laughs> things that other people were doing and I made them a little bit different. So I would go look at, you know, the sold listings of my competitors or other eBay, you know, vintage sellers and be like, oh, wow, like this thing sold for $450. And I would just go find that thing. I was really resourceful. So if I wanted to find like a Saint Laurent jacket um, or Yves Saint Laurent at the time, it's now Saint Laurent again, but in like the <laughs> 80s, there was a label that was just Saint Laurent. So I would go and I would look up misspellings of designer brand names and find that stuff on eBay. So I could resell so, and, and it and it works and I could resell it. Now I think it corrects your spelling. It didn't. <laughs> um, I, you know, I loved being creative and I wanted to be a photographer. That was what I wanted to go to college for. I got accepted to the San Francisco Art Institute and in, the uh, California College of Arts and Crafts. I would love to go to art school. It's $50,000 a year. No one's going to pay for that. But I got to take photos and cast models and style them. And I didn't know how much I would love that. But I got to be creative in, in a distributed way with like copywriting and all these different touch points that having an online business gives you that doesn't make you necessarily an expert in any one thing when you're doing that. But possibly just really good at, at a lot of things, which is what I, I feel like I am and what, um, you know, added to my success. One of the things you just said, which is something not most often heard on this show is people who are entrepreneurs categorizing themselves as introverts. And mm -hmm. I think it's important because I think sometimes when people are more happy 
not in front of the camera, they assume they cannot have a platform and they cannot build a business. And people get very anxious when they think about having to build a business and then show up somewhere on social media. And they feel like that literally makes my nervous system go out of whack. So how will I build yeah. a business? So I just won't build a business. So for people who are listening, who don't prefer to share their life or to be on camera, telling people what they're eating in the morning and building a social media following and all that stuff. How do you think you have done that? And what do you think then actually matters in a platform? If it isn't in fact showing yourself 24 seven and having to be constantly in this position that you don't want to be as an introvert, what actually yeah. then do you think is all that really actually matters in building a platform? Yeah. So I built an audience by way of there being press and the book and, you know, I didn't emerge as an influencer or a content creator. I have an audience because of that. And so a lot of people are starting from zero and they're like, I need to get a following and I'm growing an audience and you need to make content. And it's so much more considered and strategic now what we put on social media. Um, I now am kind of like, you know, coming in the back door to this and I have an amazing audience, but I can't just like post pictures of whatever random stuff. People really want value. They follow people to get value from them. Yeah. And as much as I don't love recording a reel, I mm -hmm. love the response of, of people who find value in what it is that I might have to say, or who find inspiration in what I'm doing. And so with any job, with any job, we do things that we don't want to do. And yeah, personally, this it's really, I would, if I didn't have to like comb my hair or like, you know, I literally will record content after this because I put on lipstick today Yeah, yeah because I call. haven't this week, you know Good what call. I mean? Like I'll just stack things that I need to do and recording some reels for Instagram, you know, would I rather be doing something else? Probably. But when I publish those things, the, the outcome is something that's so gratifying to me that it makes it all worth it. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're an introvert and you're hesitant to be posting on social media or putting yourself out there, reminding yourself of the value that it is that you have to the value that you have to offer people is something that if you keep that in mind, when you're doing this, it doesn't feel like a scam. It doesn't feel salesy right. it doesn't feel, you know, it might not be comfortable, but that's part of any job. Yeah. Right. I try to remind myself, like, this is also a job and people say like, only do what lights you up. If it doesn't light, I'm like a lot of stuff doesn't light me up. Agreed. It's a job. I have to market my, what I do. And also you know, if I can provide value for people that makes me really happy, yeah, what matters, beautiful. what matters is that value. Yeah. Um, it could be audio on a podcast. It could be sharing, you know, quotes from your podcast in a way that doesn't require you to be on video. Video is important because the algorithm prefers it. But, you know, can you create reels about your morning routine or whatever things, if you're a nutritionist, right? What it is that you eat in the morning or what you recommend for people or a new yeah. kind of adaptogenic drink that you created that can help people calm the nervous systems with certain whatever yeah. powders. Um, you don't always have to be on video to do that. There are creative ways to share what it is that is your zone of genius or have yeah. to offer. Yeah. Don't require you to be like a clown dancing. No offense right. to anybody who does, because I do, but it can feel really clowny dancing to a trend to trending audio, right? Yeah. It's what I love about this is you said earlier this word about intention. And like when you're scaling without a sense of clear intention, that can like lead to not your favorite things. And what you're just saying right now, which I really like, and I don't know that many people have shared this, is that if the intention is not about getting the likes and the follows, but about sharing value, you actually, as an anyone introvert or extrovert might, might actually feel better about it. Right. And I do think we set ourselves up to feel a little icky when we're playing for the cheers, mm -hmm. but if we're playing to give a couple people value, it really does change it. And I, I love that, that that's so for you. I also want to ask you one more question about the book. And then I want to talk about business class, which is your okay. timely pre premium digital course. 
and we'll, yeah. we'll just spend a lot of time on that. But before we go to business class, your book, as you've now like said a few times, really was like one of the biggest things that built your platform. It was like this book. I mean, to sell that many copies is like 1% of 1% of 1% of all books have ever sold that many. It's, it's, it's insane how many copies of that book you sold. One of the things about that book that is so powerful is how unabashedly honest you are in that book. And I just wanted to ask you about your reflection on why you think that book was successful, because in my opinion, it is no small thing. Like it's one thing if it's a good book and like people buy it. Right. But for you to sell that amount of books, there was something yeah. guttural. There was literally something visceral in the experience of reading it that people were telling their friends, you have to read this. What, what in your reflecting on it, do you think made the biggest difference for readers? Yeah. I mean, I think like anything that strikes a chord, it has to fill a gap that is, that doesn't, you know, that, that is waiting for, for something or someone, whether it's a product or a conversation or personality. And in 2014, when I wrote that, when I published that book, I wrote it in 2013, Lean In had just come in a, a, out mm -hmm. a year prior. So Sheryl Sandberg, mm -hmm. the COO at Facebook's, you know, first book that was about women and leading, but she had this amazing pedigree and any woman who had written a book that was, that lived in the business book section was like, it was like Susie Orman, who's a finance expert. There wasn't a lot of them to begin with. And there certainly weren't any community college dropouts with a choppy haircut <laughs> talking about starting a business because to a lot of us, business people looked like that, right? So it was a story no one had really heard. Um, and I think it provided a mirror for a lot of women to be like, whoa, like I actually went to college. I'm so far ahead of her. I could do this. You know, I have access to this. I have a digital camera. I can start an online business. And Girl Boss really kind of cracked open the business book section for a whole lot of other books mm -hmm. by women. And it's been just amazing to see so many more women sharing their stories. Mine was just one. Um, it was infused with humor, right? Yes, honesty, but humor. Like it was a fun and funny book. You know, my story is like really goofy and unlikely and it's very kind of, I think I talk about smearing poop on the wall in like on the first page, like in kindergarten, like in Montessori, you know? Um, I might even share that I picked my nose. I'm not sure. This could be my, this could be my big announcement. Um, and honesty is like, it's funny how, it's funny how much people think honesty is a novelty or like unique. Yeah. Like how sad is that? What are we all doing? What are we, what, what kind of script is everybody walking around yeah. with? It's really I'm interesting. All, I'm like disappointed in humanity when I'm like applauded for being honest. Also, I'm too lazy to, to be like premeditated. I'm like ADD and not good at preparing for anything. So when someone asks a question, I just, whatever's in my head is what comes out. So yeah. So I've lived in LA since 03 and, uh, I have a, a few friends who are very successful screenwriters and I won't say who this person is, but she's very successful. And she, she said something to me that was so good. She was telling me how she reads some scripts and like they're horrible. And she knows right away when something is not going to work. And she told me something that I think you will relate to. She said, do you know what you have to do to make the audience hate a character? Like, what do you think you have to do so that the audience doesn't root for a character? And I'm like, I don't know. I've never thought of that. She said, make the character perfect. She said, mm. if the character is perfect by the end of the first act, the audience hates that person. They have no mm. sympathy. She said, however, if the person can laugh at themselves, if the person has no shame about themselves and they have flaws, mm. the entire audience is rooting for them the entire time. And I think your book, is a book where there is a girl in this story who's like, these are some things I've done that I'm not proud of. These are some things I've done that I'm really proud of. This is my life. 
I don't really take myself so super seriously. And yet I think there's value in who I am. End of story. That is so unique because people want to belong so bad that they will do everything to be impressive. And what I learned from this conversation with my friend, who's a screenwriter, I'm like, you're so right. It's what makes people not like you. It's actually people le- talk about lean in people yeah. lean into you because you say things like, yeah, one time when I was like, not feeling myself, I like stole something and everybody's like, I, I, I relate to you. Like, you know what I mean? Like that yeah. is, it's just giant. And I think that's why, I think that's why you've had such a giant career is because there's a likability in like, in the honesty of not trying to be somebody that you're not. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think about like Cameron Diaz and Drew Barrymore and Jennifer Aniston, like rom-coms when you say that. And like these women who are like kind of bumbling, exactly. you know, Bridget Jones's diary or whatever. And it's like, people love those characters and I'm not like trying to be one, but I guess maybe I'm comic relief in some way to the, to the very serious, you know, women in business, which I admire and I've learned so much from, but I'm just like not faithful of it. But nobody is. That's the point. It's like, we, we see through it. And so again, going back to that conversation about, you don't need to be somebody who you are not, you don't have to live on other people's terms. It's like, it it excites me that you have an online course and we'll get into it now. It excites me that you write books. It's exciting because you're, you're a stand for the possibility that people can show up as they are and figure it out. And that, that can be enough. That can be more than enough. And actually I think allowing yourself to not be perfect is what gives you the permission to try things because when you have to be perfect, sometimes you don't get anywhere because you're stuck in analysis. So let's talk about business class. Um, when does it open up again? Cause the last time I checked your website, it was on wait list. Yeah. It opens up again in April. Okay, um, so not there's a wait list at businessclass.co right now. So we launch it twice a year. Um, we may start doing it on a rolling basis after April. And so okay. people can kind of join anytime, but right now um, the, the ride is closed for it's under construction. That's okay. They're going to um, get on the wait list. Tell us, let's yeah, talk so about April, who it's for. Let's talk about where you yeah. need to be before you sign up. Like, do you need to already have the idea? Do you need to have already made $10,000 in revenues? Tell us yeah. who it's for. Yeah. One thing before I tell you that yeah. is what you just said before you asked me that question was that we can kind of show up as ourselves and that's really inspiring. And one of the first things that I have students do in business class is text their friends and family and say like, what am I really good at? You know, what is my like strength? Like, what am I, you know, people, we don't ask that and not everybody offers that to us. And then also like looking at your texts and thinking about who your friends come to you for, what kind of advice do they come to you for? You know, that's one way to start kind of from zero and think about what it is that, how you could really help people. Um, Business class is for everybody, men and women. It's mostly women um, who have a business that's already running. We have students who are doing a million. We have students who are doing 20 million in revenue. We have students who are starting from zero in business class works for all of them. Um, If they, you have to at the very least have an idea. So coming to business class being like, I think it would be cool to start a business. I have zero ideas. It's going to be overwhelming. So you can have a couple ideas even because in the beginning of business class, we take you through validating that um, or kind of playing with both of them, talking to potential customers, looking at the competition and, you know, and your strengths, where is best for, you know, for me to play. And then for the existing business owners, it, that process allows them to audit their business and say, okay, like I've been doing this this way, but I never kind of went back and looked at what I was doing. And maybe I'm not talking to my customers in the same way that I should be. Maybe I haven't talked to my customers at all and going through that process in the beginning. Um, it's largely bootstrap founders. Um, so it's not necessarily people who are like, have a, a deck and just waiting for people to give them money. It's a lot of solopreneurs, it's jewelry designers, it's service providers and you know financial planners or someone with like a mushroom growing kit. Um, there's coaches. So it really like, it r- runs the gamut. There are a lot of online, you know, business owners, yeah. whether it's e-commerce or people yeah. providing services online. 
Very cool. Let me ask you this question. So as a result of what we do, we meet tons and tons of people who want to even begin to think about this, which is really great that we met because we can probably send a lot of people your way. Oh. Um, and what's fascinating to me, it's fascinating. It's not shocking, but I want to hear your thoughts on it because no matter what they'll figure out about what it takes, they'll spend the time on website copy. They'll spend the time on product development. They'll spend the time on researching, but the part that's scary as hell is actually getting a sale, right? Actually going into the market and selling this to a person, whether you're DMing the person, whether you're having an actual conversation with a boutique owner, like whatever it is that for you is the person who needs to become your buyer. This mm -hmm. is where everybody's like, er! and it's just like, what do you think it takes for someone to allow themselves to push through that fear? Because at the end of the day, you can keep looking at your website copy and you can keep showing me your products and you're not going to get momentum unless you're willing to sell. And it's just mm -hmm. like, Mm -hmm. People are so averse to it. And yeah. then I say to them, like, no going in, no going in that if you have a business at some point, there's a client at some point, there's a transaction and you have yeah. to be willing to do that. So what do you think makes that work? And what do you think allows somebody to get over that fear? Because it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. I like to say that your first product should be your, is your worst product and that you should start ugly. If you spend a bunch of time, like time is money. If you're spending a ton of time perfecting this thing that you haven't even validated, Agreed. that you don't even know people want, yep. you're wasting a lot of time and money because as soon as you put that, into the, that out into the world, you're going to learn more than anything you know about business because you're going to hear from people whether they like it or not. And they may not like it. And that's okay. That comes with running a business. And then you get that feedback and you're able to tweak. And before you spend all the time on the perfect website and the perfect video or copy or the perfect, perfect, like, you know, product, put a prototype in front of somebody, put a web design in front of somebody, um, you know, have them read your copy, bounce things off of people, do something in a really manual way before you build the technology. Class pass, for example, literally it was like a hamster wheel, like with yeah. a butt. It was like, there was a person like, booking the classes for people before they even built the booking platform. So they were able to validate that there was a desire to book classes at multiple studios. Now they're, you know, a massive business they sold to MindBody. It's an incredible story, but you can start with just like literally picking up the phone. Um, you don't have to build anything special. And we teach that in business class it's called an MVP or minimum viable product and getting that out into the world as quickly as possible is really important. Um, otherwise it's just navel gazing. Like I'll insult you. Like I just, let me shame you into starting <laughs> because what is it? Idle hands are the work that well, whatever, I'm not religious, something like that, but it's easy to think and to consider and be like, should I do this? You know? And at a certain point you have to commit uh, even if it's not perfect and that's where you learn. And the earlier you fail, the better you'll get at it. I failed too late. I wish my business had done worse in the beginning. I get that. Because it would have prepared me for what happens later when the stakes are so much higher. Yeah, I totally get that. And it's so true. And it is very, it's good. It's good actually when you said like, I'm going to insult you to get you started, but it's important. You know why? Because Ultimately, people don't want to stay in their fear, right? No one really is happy in their fear if they're scared. Mm -hmm. They want to get out of it. And if you're not going to pick up that phone or have that conversation with the person who's your buyer, there's no point. There's just no point. And in, in having those conversations, like what allows you to let go of feeling rejected, I guess, is the question. Because I think what people think is a business problem is a courage problem. I think people are so afraid of rejection mm -hmm. that they don't build a business. Hmm. I mean, I think it just comes with, comes with life, right? And there's no reward without risk and you don't learn from yeses, you learn from no's. I mean, you learn from both, but what I've learned the most from is hardship. 
and it's what it's what's made me better it's what's allowed me to give people more value you know back to social media content or creating an entrepreneurship program like business class when we're winning you know the water is beautiful and blue and when the tide recedes you see what all that murky mud looks like you know and the maybe there's a you know a yeah can, a seven up can and a fish bone and all the stuff that's happening under the hood that you don't realize is happening until somebody rejects you, your company falls apart, you know, whatever it is, like things plateau and you have to solve problems. Yeah. Yeah. It's well said. I mean, one of the things that you and I haven't, we have a few things in common, but one of the things my parents got divorced when I was like just starting high school, I think yours was a little bit later, but one of the things for me that I've said to people when they're like, how have you like started a few multi-million dollar businesses? Cause it, it requires the grittiness. And I'm like, I remember as a kid being pretty uncomfortable. Like there was a lot that was uncomfortable about growing up in my house. And before mm-hmm. they got divorced, they had a really abusive, scary marriage and all the things. And my dad was an alcoholic and my mom was depressed and then they got divorced and it was worse. But my point is that there was a value, right? Cause it was what it was. I don't wish it on anybody. Right. But a lot of people have uncomfortable things happen. There was a value in that for me because I wasn't under the impression that life would not be uncomfortable. So Mm -hmm. the fact that things were uncomfortable, it was like, oh, I literally was like, oh yeah, of course. Like I'm going to be uncomfortable. And the fact that I was on my own so much during high school, because my dad left and we weren't in touch and my mom was going through like a serious depression. I think I gained so much from being scrappy and being on my own that I think you did too. Like I think as hard and you would never want to write that for any kid, but then going back, it's like your greatest resource is your resourcefulness. And what you saw in yourself was like, wait, I'm resourceful. And and also necessity is the mother of invention. You didn't have a choice to not be resourceful. Nobody was going to come along with a white knight suit and help you. So you did it yourself. And I feel like in some ways, we, we take that away from people. We make people too comfortable and mm-hmm. you can't really afford to be if you want to like, master. I hope you get laid off. <laughs> I mean, no, but like there's so no, beauty, but like, beauty in, there's beauty in it. So many people, it pushes them off the ledge into starting a business that they've been considering. I have, I've seen it over and over again. I don't hope you get laid off. I hope you, um, Start don't keep your day job. I hope yeah. you don't keep, I hope it's elective that you don't keep your day job. Um, but I, there's a lot of people I just want to push out of the nest. And the yeah. sooner you experience adversity in your career as a business owner, the better off that you're going to be. And you're right. I had a very critical dad. Um, and I was an only child and it was a really unhappy home. And I had to kind of develop that resilience within myself, not to say that things don't hurt and that I'm not sensitive and that I don't care what people think because I do a lot. Um, but it also gave me this like critical, maybe not the best, but self kind of accountable or even self-aware voice of, you know, of like evaluating myself and whether I'm doing a good job and always striving to be better because I had this like, not so healthy, but useful inner critic that I was granted as a child. Yeah. It makes sense because ultimately you're willing to go through rejection because you know what rejection feels like. And I think for everybody who's listening, one thing that I want to say all over and over is like, you have within you the capacity that you don't realize you have. Everybody who's listening, every person who is listening has already been through so much of the hardest stuff you'll ever go through. And you got through it with grace. And if you remembered that and you trust yourself, then you can start a business too, right? Um, I just want to ask you a question because in researching, it looks like there's other things that you have, like you have, it says, and I just want to ask you about this. Like there's a self-promotion and press free training. There's the perfect Mm -hmm. bio. And then it says one-on-one coaching. What does that mean? How could you ever be available? You probably have people who they can. Oh yeah. Are you looking at my, like when you're looking at my LinkedIn bio. So, um, I, I put out free content all over the place, whether it's on my Instagram or my newsletter, which is at sophiamarusa.com slash newsletter. So we have like 120,000 subscribers and I send a weekly newsletter. We have a bunch of downloadable guides that are free. Good. Um, 
And there's an app that I've used called intro and I am like uh, one of the experts on it and you can book me. I don't do it a ton because it's a lot of context shipping to hop on a call with someone, get to know them and be able to like give them a, any kind of guidance. Totally. I would, yeah. Um, so I don't do a ton of it. Okay. Business class is really where I try to scale my knowledge and, and you give so I much mean, in business class, by the way, I was so reading much. like it's how like many hours. lives, yeah, how many like live calls training. there's like over 60 live calls. We do them every week while the program's in session. It's amazing there's, that you do that, by the way. Thanks. And because most digital courses are literally just videos, which can all also be helpful. Yeah, but the yeah. fact that you add the live component, I think is everything. Yeah. And it's, it's very interactive. We have the lounge, which is an app, which is our community. And so the kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching I could give the community is able to give and like in a, in a distributed way that, and they know more about their industries than I do. And in many ways, the business class community is more relevant than me. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, we'll put a link yeah. to business class and we will put all that here. My last question for you is in looking back at your life and your business, What's one thing that you would do differently? I would have spent less on a wedding. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's not a valuable question. Yeah, my husband left after like eight months. So um, let's see, what would I do differently? Mm. I mean, the answer is nothing because here I am and this is my life and like, what would it be? Otherwise, I think I would have, given people more of a chance to perform in their jobs instead of throwing the towel in on them. Wow. That's I interesting. Know, I didn't know how to coach them to get them to where they needed to be. Um, and I was a young leader who could have done a better job. Um, but I don't know how I could have done that differently with the, right. what I, with the knowledge you had. I wasn't necessarily equipped to, I had a responsibility to, but I wasn't equipped to. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. Thank you for such an incredibly generous conversation. You're so lovable. You're so likable. Uh, thanks. thanks. And you're so smart. So we'll, thanks. we'll send everybody um, the link to business class, but tell mm -hmm. everyone where they can follow you on the daily. Yeah. I'm so via Instagram, I'm Sophia Amoruso, Twitter, Sophia Amoruso, LinkedIn, same thing. And then business classes at business class on Instagram. You can join the wait list at businessclass.co. Amazing. It's really yeah. valuable stuff. Yeah, I'm so you. glad I finally got to connect with you. I've Me wanted too. to for so long. Me too.